You seem good. Do I? How about you? If I was good, I wouldn't be here, would I? Would you kick my mom out? Because of me? It's been hard on her. Since you left. Hey, no, I'm not the same old Lena, okay? Well, you tell me, what are we doing here? Just be careful. It's a little late to start parenting, don't you think? Not too late at all. And now you two, running away because you think it's going to help things. At some point, somebody in this family's got to turn it around. My name is Jennifer Podemski. I am uh, here with Empire of Dirt, uh, of which I am the producer and co-star. The role originally um, uh, wasn't for me. I wasn't uh, meant to be Minnie, the grandmother. Uh, this, the film itself had a, a very long birthing process, about seven years. And originally, Shannon Masters, the writer, wrote wrote the role of Lena for me. And this was how long ago we started the film, so Lena was the daughter. Um, as time went on and we developed the film and ended up getting some financing sort of at the 11th hour and financing fell through and then we got some more and it was a lot of, a lot of, a huge struggle to make this film even possible. By the time we got to the, to the casting discussion, the director, Peter Stebbings, basically looked at me and said, you got to do this. Like, it's just, it's you, you got to do this. So I said yes, even though I knew it was going to be really challenging producing the film and, and acting in it as well. Um, but I'm really glad I did because it sort of brought me back in front of the screen. Although I have been in front of the screen since I started producing full time, I haven't been in front of the screen with this much meaning um, in such a meaningful piece, especially something so close to my heart. Um, so it was a good way to sort of get back and I, I suppose I, I used what I call channeling, you know, I wasn't really, I don't really feel like I was acting, I was really channeling, you know, the grandmothers and all of the, the moms that I know. <clears throat> um, and that, that spirit, like that grandmother spirit, you know, was, was very present for when I was for every, every time that I was on camera. And there was something about, you know, there's, a, there's this thing about props that sometimes you have something that, that ignites a part of that character. So for me, it was really the rain boots, the grandmother's rain boots. And I put them on and it was like, that was my grounding for the character. And every time I put those rain boots on, I became that character. Yes, well, I because I, I optioned the film uh, now nine years ago, um, I optioned it from Shannon Masters. So we were basically partners on this project up until um, the time Peter Stebbings came on board. Um, it wasn't your typical sort of process of filmmaking where, you know, oftentimes a, a film will be optioned and the writer will not so much be a partner but be sort of a hired a hired. Um, staff member um, or, or sometimes the film will be optioned and the producer can do whatever they want with it. They can rewrite it themselves or hire other writers. But in this case um, the project was very much a partnership between myself and Shannon and when Peter came on board it became a partnership between the three of us and we were very much invested, you know, emotionally and morally and financially <laughs> invested in the project. Um, up until I mean, it it just we're we're still the this is the partnership the three of us uh, is is really the the backbone of of the film, and uh, yeah, I'm really really proud of what we've done. I've had a lot of great experiences as an actor. I've been really fortunate. Um, some of the ones that really resonate. You know, because I come from a dance background, I was I was lucky enough to get cast uh, after a three-day audition in uh, a film called Bogus, which was it was kind of a silly film with Haley Joel Osment, but Cirque du Soleil was a part of it, and it was like his imaginary world, and uh, I got to play kind of a Pierrot the clown that flew, and it was all it was two weeks of training with the artistic director of the Cirque du Soleil, and they cut all of it out of the movie because it was scary for kids. But I got to do it, and it was it's still up there with one of my favorite roles. I also recently did a great a great episode of a show called Sensitive Skin for HBO, 
with um, Kim Cattrall and uh, a wonderful actor, producer, director named Don McKellar and it was really, it's all comedy. It was a very precise kind of comedy. So I got to sort of exercise my, my comic muscle. That was awesome. I've done, I, I don't think, I think there have been more favorite roles than, than you know, demeaning, degrading, buckskin kind of stereotypical roles. I don't think I ever became an actor. I think I was born kind of a performer. And it was just something, I think you know it. Like you see it in, in little children. You see it. When you're older, you, you absolutely can pick those people out. And I, I think I was one of those kids who I wasn't really good at, I wasn't good at school. <laughs> I was really good at dancing. I was really good at performing. I was really good at making people laugh. <clears throat> Um, and I guess my, some of my teachers recognized that and that was sort of back in the day when the arts was more a part of curriculum where we would, you know, do choir during school and do music class was a big part of learning and then we'd go out touring, you know, to old age homes and I would play the clarinet and I would do dance solos and then my parents recognized it and sent me to dance class and, you know, that kind of thing. So it was like kind of a snowball thing. Um, so I, I, when I say I didn't become, I think the, my creative spirit was nurtured from all sides and I was very fortunate for that. It was really when things became professional for me that, you know, the career aspect of performing, um, kind of took over and then you have to kind of make a decision of what you want, how much you want to invest in this, you know, creative spirit because it becomes a lot less about the creative spirit than about the business, you know, you go to 50, 60, 70 auditions and especially when you look like me, you know, maybe you book one if you're lucky. I became a producer because, and that was a conscious effort and that actually was, was born in New York City. I was living on my sister's couch when she was uh, starring in Rent. Um, <clears throat> you know, her career was doing really well and I was kind of like, I was working at the Reebok Sports Club on the Upper West Side as a key girl. So I was, I wouldn't say I was at rock bottom, but I was not where, after a really great career in Canada, um, sort of walking away from that, um, I felt like I needed to get away from the industry. Um, so I put myself in a position where I would really kind of find, find my humility again, because I felt really detached you know from myself and very much sort of desperate to work as an actor and that that wasn't a comfortable place for me so while I worked here and got to experience sort of my create creative side through my sister um, I started to really think about the industry and I got an agent here and I did auditions and it wasn't a good experience. I didn't like. I didn't like the industry. I became very disenchanted with the in industry. So I started to imagine, you know, what it would take to make my own shows and be a producer. I didn't really even know what that meant at that time. I was 25. Um, but once I put that out there, I mean, I guess I must have been manifesting pretty hard because once I put it out there, sort of all of the pieces of the puzzle started to fall into place. Um, I was brought back to Canada for, to star in a short film for a friend of mine who be, has become a very successful director named Sarah Polly, and this was her first short film. And, uh, and that was a great experience. So I kind of was like, oh, okay, this was an offer, it was a great film, it's with integrity, it's creative, it's with a woman who I love and a director who you know, I wanna support. Um, I'll do that, because that's allowed. And then I came back to New York and then I got called back to do uh, what was then called the National Aboriginal Achievement Awards um, as a host. And so I did that and that was also you know, very culturally focused and very much about my community. Um, and it felt good. So I was like, okay, I'll allow that. You know, that experience is also good. So these kinds of experiences are good, but I still need something more. I need to do something more important. 
um, I need to produce, I need to make my own stuff because I'm not seeing enough Native people on TV. What I am seeing are, you know, misrepresentations of who we are and our stories and everything is just a token project and it's just, you know, it's not just, I don't care so much about myself, but what about all the future generations or, you know, the future generation of amazingly talented Native people who want to be doing this? I would rather create those roles for them than you know, fight so hard and struggle so hard to, for me to get recognition. Um, and then another call came in for a TV series in Canada and it was a role I couldn't turn down. Like they had asked me to, to star on this show prior to me going to New York and I turned it down because I had already made the decision to leave. Um, but then they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Not financially, but they said, we're, we're going to get rid of this character. You can play this character now, and it's going to be a bold move because she's white, and she's going into a coma, and she's going to wake up as you, and, you know, it's a great role, blah, blah, blah. So I took it. And then on that, it was that summer that kind of everything came into place because the associate producer of the National Aboriginal Achievement Awards, which I had done several months earlier, um, contacted me and she said would love to go for coffee with you um, I think we might have some of the same objectives um, and life goals we met <clears throat> talked about our our experiences growing up like as a urban half-breed and uh, our experiences with the media and basically determined that we had to do something to change that and to create <clears throat> create something that would address the um, the void um, of Aboriginal or Native uh, presence in the media. So when I was shooting this television series, Riverdale, um, one of the actresses on the show had a TV series that she produced and it was like a, it was a night, a night show with arts and entertainment type of content. So I decided to spend my lunches talking to her about her business model and how she kind of got it up on up on its feet and how she raises money and how she structures a TV show like that and on and on and on. Anyway, so that's really the summer that everything came together, that I, I became a bona fide producer because that was when Laura Milliken, who, well, you know, and we've, you know, we started talking about creating Big Soul Productions, which later became Big Soul Productions, which later the first series became the seventh generation which was, you know, three seasons of an Aboriginal youth role model television series. We created our own funding models and our own business model. We had an office. We had a fully functioning production company. And this was all by the time I was 26. And it was really, it really came together quite quickly, like within that year. Um, so it was pretty amazing. And it was just a lot of passion. Like we put our heart and souls into that company. And together we created Seventh Generation, Into the Music, like a lot of lifestyle type shows. Um, that ended up being on APTN and other networks as well. But the real big thing came for us when we, when we started training kids behind the scenes. And one of our training pro projects was directed by Randy Redroad, which then went to Sundance and that became Moccasin Flats, which then became a TV series, uh, the first dramatic TV series in Canada, in, probably in, Amer in North America, to be produced, written, created by an Aboriginal team. We did three seasons of that and then, um, you know, won awards, and it was really, really successful. Um, but at that time, we were sort of at a, at a crossroads, and I decided to leave the company and go off on my own and do things that, you know, I wanted to focus a little bit more on training. I wanted to focus a little bit more on my acting career and do things that were sort of outside of the company. I didn't love the business part of it. I didn't love the company, like going to an office every day. And that's what it really requi required. I like working from home. I love sitting for hours on end writing and not having to worry about feeding, feeding nine employees every month. It was too much of a, a stress and it was counterintuitive for me. So after f six years uh, at Big Soul, I decided to branch off on my own and uh, yeah, start Red Cloud Studios. And then through Red Cloud Studios, actually, I would say Empire of Dirt, which was at that point called Sight Unseen, was the first project that I optioned when I branched off on my own as a producer, as an independent producer at Red Cloud Studios. And then I'd have done a bunch of stuff on my own with other partners, but Empire of Dirt sort of represents the uh, 
the one project that I, I have nurtured from the beginning and actually from the beginning of myself as a, as a standalone independent producer. Well, um, I think like my film, for example, is it was incredibly difficult to make because of the female slant. It was such a challenge um, to put three native women on the screen and and prove to people or convince people that it was uh, that it would capture audiences. Um, and I'm sure many women have that same struggle. I know as a native woman, it, it's you know three or four times as hard to get anything done. But maybe it's because we're women that and we have you know a certain uh, a certain nature about us that when when we choose to do something it is very much like this was very much like having a child for me and I don't necessarily think it's exclusive to people who have had children I think it's just an, an instinct it's like a it's a biological thing that we're built that way and we have the tenacity to stick through some very challenging turbulent times and it always is if you're a native woman trying to make content there's just no way that it's going to be easy i don't think there is really any specific support um for for i mean for women filmmakers there are like in toronto we have the you know women in film and television there are a lot of groups that are dedicated to helping women tell their stories and that sort of thing but um, it's not so much like for me, even as a as a mom, you know, I was never one of those moms who went to support groups or baby groups or any of those things. I tend to really fall into a, a cycle of support that involves my family. You know, my husband is a fantastic support to me and I definitely would have never been able to make this project without him um, because he became the, the mom, you know, the so-called mom while I was doing this and other things um, and put his career on hold. Um, my mom, my dad, my sisters, I mean, my aunts, my cousins, like the, that's my support group. I don't go anywhere else for support. I'm very, very fortunate to have the support that I need around me. You can, well, you can't escape the reality that making a film as a native person is, is not a political act, is not a, a socially conscious act. I mean, this is very much like, you know, it's 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 fighting a battle it's pushing against the norm you're trying to squeeze into a place that doesn't exist yet you know you're trying to find a seat on a bus that isn't there and in order to to stand up and state your case and make your point and show that you're relevant and that you mean something that you matter and that you know you have all of these people following after you behind you and and also proving that you have so many generations of ancestors that came before you you know to that you you need to honor to make sure that your place is um, is solidified it becomes you can't help but bring you know that political that activist spirit into it it isn't it is an act of of political activism because we're doing things that are shaking the are shaking the boat are rocking the boat that people are uncomfortable with because generally speaking most Canadians and Americans have no concept of what Native America is have no concept of what a Native person is um, and in order to raise awareness anytime you're raising awareness and educating people and taking a stand and telling your story it's political what can you do <laughs> so much work to be done so much work I still feel very much, you know, even at the big awards shows and all the press and all the publicity and all the traveling and all of that stuff, um, the, I still feel very much like, um, you know, the outsider and, you know, the, the, native, the native film. Although um, I was very, very happy to see at TIFF this year, this past year, where, where Empire of Dirt premiered, that the two films, there were two native dramas which I don't know if it's the first time, but I'm pretty sure it's the first time. So the very fact that there were two dramas that were so-called native films, um, I think is a sign that the paradigm is shifting and things might be moving in a different direction. Because typically 
there's like room for one. And clearly these are two, like I'm, I'm referring to Rhymes for Young Goals, two very, very different stories. Like they are at the opposite ends of the spectrum from one another. Um, but they were both included in TIFF in different programs, but still. So it's hard to talk about the native film when there's two of them. So what we need to do is we need to get more and more out there so that we're just called films. <laughs> I think the thing in Canada is that we just, we, we have a little bit more of an edge in terms of visibility because, you know, we have APTN, we have, um, we have a little bit more um, visibility um, in the media because CBC, our, our national sort of public broadcaster, is a lot more um, mainstream than, let's say, a PBS. It's a lot more uh, classy to watch. Like, everybody watches it. Well, maybe the right wing, you know, doesn't watch it, but it's, wa it's watched by the mainstream. Um, but I don't, I, I don't know that I feel optimistic. I, I feel like this, making this film was one of the, was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life next to having children and raising kids. And it, it just about put me in the ground, I think. Like, I got very physically ill from the experience. Um, it was so hard to raise the money. It was so hard to see it through, and it's very difficult to sell it. You know, we're, we've just gotten, uh, we just signed with a U.S. distribution company, but it's not like we're signing with Miramax or, you know. Telefilm Canada did support this. Yes, they were one of our major supporters, but we also were rejected by them twice prior to getting this, this round of funding. So we made this for about four times less than we intended to, and uh, like it was under $400,000, and it was uh, definitely, it was a laborious, you know, uh, uphill climb. I'm still trying to figure out what's next. Um, I have a lot of opportunities. I mean, I'm, I am developing a show with Laura Milliken. Um, after all these years of not working together, we're developing a TV series together. I am, I produced, uh, the show is called The North End that I'm, I'm developing with Laura. Um, but that's in the very sort of preliminary stages. Um, I produce a, an awards show in Canada called the Inspire Awards, which used to be the National Aboriginal Achievement Awards that I hosted in 1999. So that came full circle. So I've been producing that show. That's been my, that's, that takes about 10 months to do. So I do that as a, you know, I would say most of a full-time focus. Um, I have a TV series called The Other Side, which is, uh, I'm also really fascinated with the, with the horror genre and the, um, what do you call it? the uh, ghost hunting genre. So I created a show called The Other Side that ha is a ghost hunting show, but it sort of has a native slant and we're going into our second season um, in a couple months. I think a big part of the future of the, of native filmmaking or, you know, stories from the indigenous communities will have a lot to do with support from the communities themselves. I think it's still very difficult to um, to convince communities and band councils and tribal councils that filmmaking and storytelling is, you know, it's ancient and we've just moved into a different way of doing it. You know, it's, it's, maybe it's not oral anymore, but it comes from an oral place. It comes from the oral tradition. It is our oral tradition. And if this doesn't exist on screen, it may not exist, period. And our communities and our leaders have to understand that um, the weight of this calling is is very very heavy and we're in a situation I think where if we don't take the opportunity to invest in our storytellers today we will be paying for it you know a hundredfold tomorrow. Um, I think there are some very uh, you know innovative leaders out there in terms of people who would you know they're I think right now everyone's so confused or so focused on, you know, the fire <laughs> uh, that they're not looking at the, you know, the, uh, I guess, the, they can't see the forest through the trees, that what's going to happen, that the next fire, <laughs> they can't foresee the next fire. So today it's, you know, it is land, land rights and treaty rights and treaty land entitlement and 
um, you know, water and resources and that sort of thing, which is so, so important. But on the other side, there's also infrastructure and infrastructure can be built, like moral infrastructure can be built by storytellers.